Mr. Allison, what's going on, sir? Oh my God! It's the king of all sports here, sir. I say, sir. I say you are the king of risky business, and you have gotten one risky business too far, sir. Too far, I say. God bless us all. God bless us, everyone. Um, this thing needs to. I'm just gonna not worry about that. Oh. The Jesus lizard? Is that? Oh, like I, I Jesus lizard could go fuck me. I I fucking hate Jesus lizard. We were on, you know how like a, a comedian will sometimes kick a better comedian off the show? Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus Lizard did that to Spoets. We were going to play CBGB's on a Wednesday. We had it booked way the fuck ever. Then all of a sudden, Jesus Lizard gets a, a gig. Um, this was before the internet, so they couldn't Google us. But they heard the word on the street about us. And they were not going to do their tame little show in front of some, bring their fans in, and they turn them all into <laughs> fucking Spoets fans. What so Jesus lives in the show. <laughs> Sir, have you not Googled me? <laughs> <laughs> I was booked on 2010 9-11, a place called the Volume 11 Tavern in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, it's a big place, and Spoets always fills any place we play, because we might never play again. We might be in jail. Who knows? <laughs> I've got the whole crew there. I got Elvis Chicken, Crappy the Clown. I've got uh, 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 Kirk from Buzz Oven. Which you, you wouldn't know who that is, but that's like a a, a very famous '90s uh, heroin metal band who used to bring us along. Like as as, as rowdy as our show got, got, Buzz Oven always topped us. Huh? But just with three people: him, Dixie, and, and whatever drummer they were using. And just like stand up and and presence, fuck all. And I was like, man, if I could get Kirk, because Kirk was just uh, just coming off of heroin and about dying, and I and he needed money, and I, I got him a hundred bucks to come play with us for the for the show. Of course, I've known him since he was seventeen, and the, we were in the Charlotte scene together. He was in a thing called Sewer Puppet or Sewer Trial or something like that. Uh -huh. And I still have the little cassette that he gave his first his first cassette that he handed me. Hey Scott, look what I've done! I'm in a band now. And uh, and so like and then like uh, Jeff Clayton, who's of course a shithead, and uh, it was, I, know, I know him real well, too too well actually. I was I was I was at his uh, his wedding, which got covered by the Weekly World News, and the bride wore black. We got into the beer before. Evidently, I don't go to a lot of weddings. There's an etiquette about not drinking before the ceremony, <laughs> and me and my buddy Buster Cherry, we got in and we started we started hammering like the beer because I was back in my drinking days, uh, which you don't even want to see me in my drinking days. Uh, I didn't do any art. Well, I had a sketchbook that I was. I've got like Henry Rollins and uh, and Flipper and uh, John Cale and all these drawings of them that I did live while they were performing. Uh, I have stacks of them. Uh, you know, Fetching Bones, Let's Active, R.E.M., uh, just a, a list of, of bands. And they were just bands. They were just my friends. I didn't know they were famous. I mean, I knew Henry Rollins was famous, but, but you know, back in the 80s, who the fuck knew who Black Flag was? Yeah. I mean, he's in fucking Details Magazine now. Yeah. But who the fuck knew who <laughs> Black Flag was? And, uh, and they were just this, this another stupid punk rock band to come, come through and, and fuck it up. And I was the bouncer at the place called the Milestone Club. Now I'm an architect. I don't know if you know that. That's not. That's part of my secret identity. That's why I go under King Spoet. It was supposed to make me not Googleable. This is what I do for a living. That's one of my designs. Really? Really. I have three <laughs> pieces. I know. I know. Right. Wow! Anything visual arts or arts oriented, I can fucking do. I've been a slam poet. Now, tell me about the. Well, tell me first of all, like how you became interested in, like the the the, the Gigi Allen sort of scene. Like, like. Uh, maybe, well, how I, old were I, you when you first got interested in? This I, I was one of. The, I was 16 years old, in Atlanta when a little band called the Sex Pistols played, and I was there. I remember so very little of that show. I remember the Cruzados was on, and I'm looking, and, and you, you know what poppers are? Yeah, I know. 
have some of No, there. thank you. They, well, they, they, don't, they don't actually work on me anymore. Whatever like little thing that they do to your brain, you know, they make you go, oh, and then they, they, it's a really a pretty good drug. If you're like drinking cough syrup and liquor, old poppers goes, you just mellow you right out. That was my favorite thing because I could get it. <clears throat> and, and, and I just quit uh, doing Black Beauties because I had almost killed myself at a New Year's Eve party on liquor, dope, and black beauties, and I was like, this was You were just 16, huh? No, that was 15. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I got a demon behind my eyes. I have a loving family, but something's wrong with me. I don't know what the fuck it is. Uh, whoever, whatever it is, I just hope it wasn't discovered by Dr. Asperger, you know, whatever. I don't want to be like... <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to have Asperger, you know. I met Dr. Happy Fun Time. You know, that's what I want. I want Happy Fun Time Disorder. <laughs> so, so like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Fuck it. You know, I, I'm man, manic depressive. Garden variety manic depressive. Um, hypersexual. Mm -hmm. um, violent. I'm not now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm into the Buddhist, not the, the woo Buddhist, but like the atheist Buddhist. Mm -hmm. Meditation. Which... And when I quit drinking, 23 years ago, I quit fighting on the same day. Because they were cheesed off at me, probably for fucking their girlfriend or something. Because I would do that. I, I'm famous for fucking in, in bathrooms. <laughs> or infamous. I will get your girlfriend. I will take her into the fucking bathroom. I'll bend her over and take her right there on the fucking toilet. And yet I'm still a Blumpkin virgin. And no one has given me a goddamn Blumpkin. The one of these hell? days, I'm going to have like a chili cheese fries. I'm going to pull some whore into the bathroom. And I'm going to have me a fucking Blumpkin! I get Icy Mike, our bass player that can't play. I have him running through so many pedals that you don't know, know what the fuck he's doing. You know, he doesn't know how to set them up either, so I'm setting up his pedals for him. Uh, either the Dildo Queen or the Grinder Girl. You know Letterman's like Grinder Girl thing? No. But he did a thing where they, they bring out a girl and they grind on her pussy. It's on YouTube. <laughs> they, it, you know, black leather with a grinder, and it sparks. That's Jen. They're, they're fucking us off on that one. They were at our 1993 show when Jen did the exact same stunt. They introduced themselves at like the interns or whatever. And, ah, what's up here? and then a couple months later, I'm like, Jen, they're doing Jen. So, you know, our first brush with uh, TV fame. Well now, wait, take me back to when you were about 16 and you started to like, t t t go to see some of, you, you saw the Sex Pistols, and yeah. then and then what kind of opened up for, for me? Well, I, before I was Sex Pistols, I was in prog rock, because I was a little shithead, you know, and I was smarter than everybody else, so I had, yes, to have, I had to have some music that was impossible to figure out. Mm -hmm. if, if, if anybody else could listen to it and, and understand what was going on, it was not complicated enough for me, you know. Uh, Ammon, Ammon Jewel from the uh, Hawkwind, huh. yeah, the Motorhead, the Lemmy's old band. Uh, they, it, Sex Pistols, I said, they, they, they fucking hate every kind of music except Hawkwind. Psychotic Pineapple, um, and and like I would re back before the internet, we were priests of the secret knowledge. You could find a record, and nobody else had it. How the fuck do you get a Psychotic Pineapple record? I know. You fucking call a record store in London and you give them a bunch of money. And then you're the only one that has one. And you don't make tapes for anybody. And then you, you come over to your house and you play one cut off of it. And, oh, I can't put that back away. <laughs> That's the kind of shit I was into. Uh, J.G. Ballard, uh, John Wayne Gacy, uh, G.G. Allen. Of course, G.G. Allen. And I thought it was my duty to open for G.G. Allen. That was going to be my like crowning achievement in my art. Because I always thought my next gig's my last one. Because what I do, we, we come in and we smash up a venue. We had one time, this is the only one, I, I don't even know if I should say this one. <laughs> this one embarrasses me. <laughs> I went to the pet store and I went to the snake feeding cage and I got a hundred feeder mice thinking that they were dead. Right, because they're going to go snake food. So I figured I'd give them their shot at life. So I built this thing. I'd already had it built before I got the mice. Um, a bunch of tubes, uh, a, a air compressor. So you stuff the mice in the tubes, put paper over the top of it, 
and you wait till the show. You put a little water in there, maybe, I don't know, but 100 mice in, in these fucking tubes. So we go to the show, and the show is already chaos. Our, our fans are the worst. They're criminally insane, alcoholics. Uh, they come in, we, we got a couple of TVs, that, the, the bar that I booked, I booked the bands there. The only band I couldn't book was my own. <laughs> I, we tour all over the place, and like, you know, like the drugs would call. Hey, Scott, can you have me? Sure, man, I love your stuff. How about, can, you, can we open for Spots? No. Why not? I thought we were friends. I can't book my own band. <laughs> so I had a following, like a cult following in the 90s, where um, I would get a couple hundred people that would come to anything I did because they knew it was going to be great. We'd do Torture King, you know, where he'd do the, the stuff. It was before, you know, it was, Jim Rose was going on there, but, but it was pre-internet, so not everybody had seen it. We had people like, what do call them, falling ovations, where you just like that because he's done something so gross. Now they're like, more, and they're tossing shit at him. We had Joe Christ come and do his films, and like, and fat girls cutting it themselves up. And Joe, he, but it's past now, you know, peace out, Joe. Um, he used to make his living on fat girl smoosh porn. So he would find the fat girls in the audience, and he would pay them money to, to go smoosh things with their feet. <laughs> And my people. All right, so, so why, you ask, would I be interested in Gigi Allen? I don't know. It just seemed to fit with everything else I was doing. He was it. Gigi was it. And, and he was not known like he is now. What you got to know is he was just another, he, not just another. He was the one, but not everybody knew about him. Not like now. He is so much more popular now than he was when he was alive. Yeah, yeah tell me about, like, where did he come from? He came from this fucking little New Hampshire town and him and his brother older brother Merle and I you know I have Gigi raped Merle alright so we got, we got that and they're still friends I guess a little love between the brothers uh, that's, that's a story that's out there um, Merle tells that story uh, and then you add Dino Sex which you can't make a podcast without Dino Sex um, I, I do this story about when uh, the front stand up. It's called the magical disappearing drumsticks. Dino, back when he was younger and had a tighter ass, would uh, now it's like goatsy. Uh, would play his drums up on his kit, somebody else's kit. Never plays his own kit because so much stuff gets smashed up. They come and borrow kits from other people. Is that smart, Merle? Smart. This Gigi's up dead by this time because I never. Oh, we'll get to the Gigi being dead story. But Merle, uh, uh, Dino, playing his drums, and then he'd put one in his ass. And then he'd suck it up, spit it out, pull it out, and keep playing. And he'd have another one going, you know, and it was just, I call it the magical disappearing drumstick. We went on tour with him. He did that trick every fucking night, and the last night I got one of the magic disappearing drumsticks. And I put it up in the visor of my touring van. Now, I don't know if you've ever put a drumstick in the visor of a van that's full of musicians. It's a magical thing. They can't keep their hands off of it. They'll pick it up, they'll start drumming on things. Put it in their mouth, put it in their ears. <laughs> and about halfway in there, I would start telling them the story of the magical disappearing drumstick. The punchline being, and it's here now! And they look at it, and it's brown. And it's... <laughs> I've been putting Dino's, not just any shit, celebrity poop in my mouth. And, I, ah! and uh, they finally somebody got pissed off at me and threw it out the band window. And that person was <laughs> my guitar player, Blake Els Norris. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's it. So, oh, so I'm doing that story, stand-up, just a couple months ago in Tremont in, in Charlotte. Because I, I open for a lot of metal and punk bands. Evidently, I'm worse than the metal bands, my, my stand-up, because you can understand what I'm saying. And they go, I will cut your mother, I will cut out your bosom, they can't hear it, but I go up, Amy's daddy had a vagina, and it was all stretched out, but how could a man have a vagina? And so on, so on, so on. And they go, man, you were just too over the line there, Scott. You're like, there were kids here in the thing. You know, those kids were playing cut out mommy's abortion, and I was doing, you know, fuck off shit, you know. So... We did uh, that show, and I, Dino is a little touched. I don't know if you think. It, it, he's kind of like Elvis Chicken in that he doesn't really know what he looks like. 
um, which is kind of a glam rock hobo. I mean, he's got the green hair, the yellow beard, and an expression like this, and he's always down for something. And I had this girl that I brought, which is a Spoitz girl, and she had a Dino Sex fantasy, which I don't know how the hell you get that. I'm not going to name her names, but she was on two kinds of medication. One kind, the keep her from just going, Wah! And the other kind was a circle with a slash through it. And when it gets into your bloodstream, it, it hits the little daggers in her brain that keep her from stabbing people. <laughs> but she takes those drugs, she falls asleep. I mean, that's just like sleeping pills. She can only be up a couple hours a day when she's on both of her drugs. And she likes to be out and around like most people. So we went to the, the Dino Sex show, and she's intent on doing whatever they're going to do. I suppose it's sex. I, I, you know, Dino did a sex tape, so I haven't watched it. <laughs> I don't know. I've watched Dino and live enough. I don't have to watch his sex tape. And all of a sudden, the, the stabbing part gets out there, and she starts to freak the fuck out. And she's like, doing this. And she, she looks kind of like Don Knotts. She's got that skinny, you know, ah! And more so, she's got the glasses, too. And she's this. And Dino's like, oh, we're ready now! And I can just imagine, if you can imagine that part of the movie where everybody looks like, the, <laughs> like in the wide-angle lens, good morning, let's have sex now, little girl! And she just freaks the fuck out and, and runs, and, and they're like, Scott, why'd you bring that girl over here? Not, not, not my fault. I get up there, do my story, Dino gets pissed off at me, or turned on at me, or whatever, something's happening. He gets up there, goat sees the audience, sticks two drumsticks up his ass. By the way, this is all on Vimeo if you'd like to see. I was out there with my camera up on a tripod pole and right in on his ass. Then this guy, Adam Green, who is a gr great, I say Gigi Allen, in, 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 he's, he's got his own band, I forget what the name of it is. I think he just, but the thing about being, a, being like Gigi, you gotta piss off everybody you play with on, on a regular basis. He's got this really great girlfriend, and she plays. She, he won't do a band with her. And I was saying, she's so beautiful and no limits, and you are fucking crazy. Y'all two get together and just bring any four random people together to play with you, whether they play or not, and just fuck off everything. I'll book you everywhere. But, you know, part of being crazy is not being reliable. <laughs> you know? that's, where, that's where Gigi had the hands up, because Merle was the, was the reliable one. And uh, so, so Merle made sure. So anyway, so Adam gets up there and he licks Gino's go Dino's goatsy ass right on stage. Then, like, gives Dino gives him one of the magic drum disappearing drumsticks, and he goes all pudding pop on it. Got the whole thing. Quickly go to my release forms. Got him to sign. Dino already signed because he's doing the Spoets documentary. So we're doing uh, it's called Big Time Nobody because uh, I'm I am a nobody, but I'm a big time nobody. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that, that's one of my names. I'm also the atheist psychic in that I can predict what's going to happen. <laughs> you are going to die. <laughs> atheist psychic has predicted it. Uh, and, uh, and also the king's poet. Uh, sometimes papa's poet if it's amongst uh, the girls. Um, so let, let, let's... Uh, I feel like I've been monologuing, man. Tell me something about you. I, 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 I've, been, I've had this, like, oh, well, I wanna, bro I, crush on you since you started your podcast. I, I just love, like, extreme gay sex stories. That's, like, my <laughs> favorite thing to listen to. It's like, to, I, and my fetish is voyeurism, uh -huh. all right, and troublemaking. Is troublemaking a fetish? Sure. <laughs> I like to drink, fight, and fuck. <laughs> but I don't fight anymore since I quit drinking. Yeah, so it's just, it's just fuck. <laughs> watch and fuck. And now that I'm old, it's mostly watch. <laughs> but I want to hear how you got, like, the, the, this story of how you, you had this goal of opening for Gigi. I like, did. like that's, well, an easy, that's an easy goal, man. How, how, what did you... It's just money. What did you... How did you learn about, like, what Gigi was... Up to like like oh he was he was it well so I, I said I was in the Charlotte scene right so I'm at the Milestone Club me I'm a music fan I go in this stupid fucking trench coat with buttons all over it, and and if you see there's pictures of it on the internet if you can find it you know this is like early eighties yeah. in Mexico or something I don't know did you when, when did you get the idea for Spoets oh oh man I had that when I was drinking um. Because I was with, I always wanted to go see this show, and this show never came. It was a show 
that was all like chaos and noise. I'm in the noise head. Einstein's in the about and uh, test department, crash worship. I love any music. It's like two robots fighting over a live monkey, if that's what it's like. <laughs> uh, John Zorn. Yeah, monkey torture music. That's what I like. That's my favorite kind of music. Now, I've mellowed a bit now. You know, I, I, uh, Now my favorite music is Captain Beefheart, you know, who's passed. And I actually work with Robert Anton Williams, who was his drummer for Doc and the Radar Station Shiny Beast. He comes out for special shows and plays bows, but you got to have a couple bucks for that because Robert's a bitch and he likes money and being flown out in hotel rooms. King Spoet will play for nothing, smash up your bar and sleep on broken glass after it's done. He doesn't care. But uh, So I had this idea for a show and I kept telling everybody about it. And uh, it's like like your fantasy. It's like Kiss, you know, where they, if you ever heard their interviews about them, I will put on the makeup and it'll be the biggest show ever and they're, they're doing that. I'm doing that except I'm a grown ass adult. And I'm doing it to all my drunk punk rock buddies, and they're all going, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. And I was drunk, too, because I was just drinking. So when I was drinking, that's what I was doing, drinking. And the drinking was tamping down the main depression enough to where I could sit down like this and talk to you. This is difficult for me, because this conversation goes too slowly. I have to slow myself down, and that's the biggest thing in my stand-up. Do you remember the old Popeyes? Yeah. When he would go, and he would like do this under the voice stuff, that's the funniest thing in the world to me. Anything that runs so fast that you can't hear it almost is my favorite stuff. And I thought, I'm going to be that comic. I'm going to go so fast that everybody's going to think it's great. But I didn't know that there's just me. <laughs> and I would go, and everybody's like, what the fuck did he just say? Blomkin, what? And my mother? God damn it. Uh, and, and so and I got some comedy lessons uh, about slowing down and pace, and, and I had the timing, but I thought timing was a lot faster. I like fast, 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 fast. But I learned meditation and breathing exercises, and I can, even though I'm as excited as I am with my new bro friend here, <laughs> excited as fuck. Um, I was also going to be excited about playing Charleston because I've fucked them off a couple of times already. And I, I, the, I, had a, I had an elderly gay gentleman in the front row. I don't know that he was gay, but if he isn't gay, there's no such thing. Uh, he was look, <laughs> looking at me, out the, and I, did, I was on last, and, or next to last, so very, very close to the end. And the entire evening, the most risque thing was said was a comment about fucking a cougar. And, it was, and the word fuck was never used. And I was, and I ended up with the lesbian cowpoke blues, <laughs> which is an old song from Spoets, which I do a cappella. Oh. And uh, dusty plains of Texas, a oh, one-known cowpoke road, one-known lesbian cowpoke, the road she called her home, a dyke all clad in leather, no dildo did she own, poor lesbian cowpoke, for fisting she did moan. <laughs> it goes on and on from there. Three, four verses. I've tried it faster and slower. It, it, it always brings down the house or walks the audience or whatever you're supposed to do in a comedy show. You know? I th isn't the point of a comedy show to piss off everybody in the club and make it all to leave? I think that's... <laughs> do this. And you can just light yourself on fire as long as it doesn't get in your clothes and wick because then it'll go... <laughs> that's, that's happened. <laughs> and and it's 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 a spo it's fire trick. You can set yourself on fire. Well, our fans know this trick because they've seen me do it, and and they ask me how I do it. So all of a sudden, we're not doing any fire, and some guy in big long hair comes in and sets himself on fire, <laughs> and the, the bartender just cries. he grabs him and throws him through the door and breaks the fucking door. And no sooner as he got him out, till the next guy's up and sets himself on fire. And then Harry's up there with the thing, and we've set up some stuff to do some skits. We're going to fill in for skits since we can't do as radical a show as we're supposed to. And he smashes our sets with a hammer. And then the whole crowd goes, and then the, the furniture is... Uh, and we got a three-camera DV shoot on this. And the owner, who's a nasty, repulsive individual named Amy, who I have a truce with, by the way, because you don't pass off King's Ball. Remember, we got the truce. Um... Remember, I get to come into the club for the shows I want, and, and, and I don't publish certain photographs I have on you that I got via the internet using... <laughs> so she's not going to... She'll never see this! <laughs>
Is this, is this on? Am I? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's right. so. So, all right. So here's the part where they piss us off. Um, they shut the show down. Uh, they get a non-sound guy to run sound, so the sound sucks. We I've spent a lot of money on the show, more than we were expected to get in. I've flown in Chuck from New York. I've flown in Ash from Wisconsin. We've got the full set of the best music. Now, Robert isn't there, but he's the only one that's missing. We play probably one of the best sets ever, and we got a live hard drive edition of this thing until shithead starts pulling shit mm. and crashes the fucking hard drive and it's all gone because the guy he didn't have one of the not nice ones zooms like we have now he had a piece of shit from the old days i pay him and then i put it out that the sound man is an enemy of the spoets he moves he quits doing dj in savannah he's gone i don't know where he is but somebody does <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get, <laughs> let's get back to you and Jesus. What, what, yeah, you and Jesus. All right, so it, get booking the. Spoet started on top. We our our third gig was the uh, uh, industrial or the experimental music fair in in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Maybe, maybe it was our fourth gig. Around about what year? Nineteen ninety. Well, I mean, we I started the band and immediately we started playing out of town because I I knew people. And we played Pittsburgh Club Feedback. We almost burned the place down. That was our third gig, I think. Our fifth gig was the Experimental Music Fair. Our sixth gig, we opened for Jad Fair. I don't know if you know who that is. King Geek Rock. And we used to do a lot of Daniel Johnson covers. We, we come in and say, oh my God, Jad Fair. We didn't even know he was playing. But the guy had listened to our stuff and had grouped us with him on that show. That's why, I guess that's why he booked us. Because we were on Gnomes at the time. And it's like, how the fuck did I get a Jad Fair gig? And then our, our, la our first New York gig, which was not a, a music gig, we couldn't get a music gig in New York at that time, 90, uh, we got a poetry gig. So it was me and, uh, and Jason doing poetry and Big Andy. And Big Andy's going to make me sad because he's dead. He died at Andersonville, the, the prison in Georgia, of uh, no insurance. He has congestive heart failure, walk, walks, in, walks into a hospital, something Emory University, the finest heart facility in the fuck world, is 30 minute helicopter ride away, maybe 20. They put his ass, they got a helicopter at that hospital, they put his fucking ass down there, give him Lasix to drain him, he dies six hours later. And talk about stupidity killing. If I knew the guy, if there was one guy in Georgia to murder, to get us universal health care to where people don't have to die, if he was in Canada, he'd be alive now. Maybe there's not enough freedom in Canada to die. I don't know. Or France, the best healthcare system in the world, where they pay a third of what we do. My buddy Big Andy. Well, anyway, Big Andy was a butcher. I met him when he was 16. He showed up at my show in a meat stain, a, a blood stained apron, and I thought it was a Halloween costume, but no, it's his work because he puts the because you have to wear a mask when you cut meat. I don't know if you know that mm. because like all the stuff you're wearing, using a saw, like if you do the big one, and shit flies up. So his mask was his hockey mask. And it, so he would be there in the Piggly Wiggly, chopping up meat in a hockey mask, spattered in blood, and he's at least a head taller than me, because big, and that big, but he's a pussy. He's a 16-year-old pussy when I meet him. And I, I've seen a lot of things. In, uh, I came to Savannah and no, no scenes, so I started booking shows. Of course I did. And here's this monster comes in, pays me three bucks to get in. Government issue. Um, Sunday school and I'm in one other band and he starts knocking people around the pit. I mean people are getting hurt and I can fight all right um, I don't like to talk about it because I'd prefer it be a surprise if I need to use it I'm looking at him and wondering can I take him and I'm not sure I'm almost never not sure I'm mean, usually sure one way or the other he's a kid he's big he's slow but if he gets his hands on me, I'm going to die. What do I do? Knee. Before he sees me. I come up behind him, I hit him in the knee, I drop him, and then I call the fucking police. I'm like, but he's 16. So then I have a brilliant idea. I tap him on the shoulder. Hey, buddy. Um, I decided to come in here. We're having problems with this guy over there. If I give you your money back, will you be our bouncer? We're best friends ever since. <laughs> but I say he's a big pussy, you know. <laughs> I, I, I showed it. I came over, um, and uh, 
he was holding a towel on this guy, and the towel was covered with blood. And I was like, Bandy, what's going on? Oh, nothing much, Scott. Gotta take this guy to the hospital. No big deal. He goes off, there's blood all over the place. Not unusual at a punk rock party. I figured the guy fell down in some broken glass or whatever. He comes back. Well, what's the, what's the problem? Well, that little guy, he pulled a knife on me. So I took my beer bottle and I smashed it over his face. <laughs> and boom! And he'd been drinking, you know, he'd been drinking. <laughs> and they, so they couldn't use and, and they couldn't use painkillers on him. So I just sat around the hospital and I watched him pull the glass out of his face and laugh at him. He saved this guy's fucking life. That guy would have bled out right there. Wow. He knew the guy's big, right? Got some knife pulled on him. Just boom. The kid he's another kid. I don't know how old, maybe seventeen. Andy's maybe 17. I don't know why he's pissed off at Andy. Maybe he's just trying to make his bones or something. Who knows? And uh, so, he, but he saves that kid's life, but then stays to watch the glass get picked out of his face without an aesthetic. <laughs> wow. That's the southern fucking scumfuck scene. Uh, that's what we call ourselves, scumfucks. Now, I don't look like one because I have personality in, in, in lieu of tattoos. So you do as well. Um, but if you don't have a personality, go ahead and get a few. Couldn't hurt. Or some tits. Tits will help a personality too. <laughs> Men or women, that they, they helps both ways. Gigi. Back to Gigi. Um, well, so I decided I'm going to book, the, the guy, I'm going to do it in the easiest way just to book a fucking show. Gigi's 500 bucks. I got 500 bucks. What did you heard about like before be, be, before you ever saw Gigi? What did you? Oh, heard? I knew all about him before I saw him. Yeah, because yeah, I said it was scum, the scumfuck scene. Andy scene had played with him a bunch of times. Um, well, he was famous. There were there were videos around. I mean, I'd seen videos, a lot of videos. He closed several clubs that I used to go to, and we, we would travel for shows. You know, Lydia Lunch or whatever to play. We'd go down to Florida because it's fucking south. South sucks. And especially in the early days, there weren't a lot of shows. And when one happened, you were there. And not now, where you know you got 800 channels and nothing on the fucking television, and you know you can sit home and masturbate the wrist podcast. You feel like it, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just like uh, there was not a lot to do, and, and and we would go. So I knew all about Gigi. I'd seen several of his performances, and I wanted one in Savannah. And so just uh, I booked one. Well, I, what 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 would what would What's typical of some of the stuff that he would do? Oh, it's a real simple thing. First of all, you do like this great music. And that's the thing that everybody forgets about Gigi. He was a killer songwriter, killer musician. And when he was young and pretty, he used to do some stuff which sounded like pop punk today. And you can find it. It's all. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But it had like, it had the lyrics, and, and the lyrics started getting crazier and crazier, you know, and, until. Uh, uh, G.G. Allen, The Holy Men, which I think is probably his best album. I don't know people might disagree. My favorite. Let's just say it's my favorite album. Yeah, Swank fucking, Bloody Mary's on the rag, Gonna Suck Your Pussy and Eat Your Bloody Rag, Bloody, 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 Bloody Mary. And then the sound, because the guy from the Chrome Cranks is playing guitar. So, and all that, that shit and piss and fuck and blood, there is music behind it. And that's what you need to know about G.G. First, there's the music. Now, you don't get any of that at the show. You have to get by the record for that. Because they play, and first thing he does is he takes crap in his hand, and he, like, he's got this thing down, and hits the entire front row of the audience with it. Then, if there's a girl there, you will grab her top, tear it off. Now, what's she doing in the front row, anyway? And he'll have sex with her right there on stage. While she's struggling, i got to say, not usually for rape. I'm, I'm all right. So I'm going. I'm going on a limb. Um, G, you know, I know. I know. It's, I know it's a. It's a brave stance I'm taking here, but I think people having sex with against their will is bad. <laughs> and I know there's people that's PTSD from having that happen to them, mm -hmm. and and some of them get pissed off at my shows, comedy shows. But I also have Afghanistan vet friends and Vietnam vet friends that don't go to fireworks shows, so. Don't come. <laughs> Don't come to my show and get pissed off at me. I'm doing fireworks if you're going to get... Well, would he get into trouble with that kind of stuff? Only put in jail. A lot. Hospital. Who fuck cares, man? 
Gigi's on the mission. His mission ends with his suicide. That's what he's going for. But he wasn't going to take it alone. He was going to do it at Halloween at midnight. He was going to bring a pistol and he was going to take five people with him. It is that what he did? No, that's not what he did. That what he did was he got got up with some of the heroin they had in the in the, the late part of the uh, '90s that was made out of some kind of synthetic crap. The trouble with it being that it would uh, clump. Uh, so you mix it and you mix it and you mix it trying to make a dilute mix yeah. for the junkies and you'd have little clumps in it. And you get one of those, you're dead. And, and, and the thing about junkies is, if that shit kills you, that means it's good. So you, if, you, if, if Tombstone, you know, brand heroin, mm. kills four people, you're like, oh man, I'm buying Tombstone, I'm just going to cut it again. But what those idiots don't realize is it's not how strong it is, it's how clumped it is. Mm. And they get killed too. And there were people dropping like flies. It wasn't like he did too much of it. He did as much as he usually did on heroin. And you know, Burroughs, um, was it uh, Ed Wood, the uh, Karloff? Not Karloff, that was, Karloff was a, was a dick sucker. The cocksucker, Karloff! That was Gagosi, a heroin addict for many years. Burroughs, uh, a lot of people, you can be on heroin your entire life and be just fine. The only thing wrong with heroin is it's illegal. Well, now, so how do you know that about Gigi planning on committing suicide? What because he, he talked about? about it profusely. If you look on my Kinks Poet One website, the biggest thing is my interview with Gigi. I did it at uh, Repo Records. And I'm trying to fuck him off on the record. I'm trying to get him to attack me by asking him pointed questions. And he's just smiling at me and just answering. And the people that are asking him sycophantic questions, he's fucking them off. And I gave him our first Poets tape, Story Hole. Imagine, imagine that. <laughs> where it, I got uh, Little Lisa, she's naked on there, and there's two pieces of tiny tape, which is like artist tape you used to have back in the day before the internets and computer stuff. You had. If you wanted a border, a clean border, you had tape. Uh -huh. Tape the border. Well, we taped one across her tits and one across her pussy. And if you pull, peeled it up, it would say it said Spoets. I <laughs> mean, there were no tits. <laughs> and if you pulled the one off her cunt, it was story hole. <laughs> and I, I I don't know if I have an original because it got really really painful putting those little tapes on there. I only did maybe fifty or hundred of them. So if you've got one with the tape on it, Edge Records, I sent twenty of them today, and I still see occasionally one in a, a used tape thing, you know, collectors whatever. But that's that's available. Story holes like out there. I mean, you can get free copies if you want one. I give it to you. Music's free. Like pussy, you know, like knuckle babies. You know, whatever you want, it's free. You can have anything I have. I'll give it to you. I don't fuck care. Now the package that costs money if you want it packaged. But if you just want my MP3s, take them. So when you decided that you wanted to open for Gigi, you wanted to open with Spoets. Fuck yeah, with Spoets. That's all I was doing back then. Yeah. Spoets. We were gonna we were gonna out Gigi Gigi. We, I had a plan to make the most fuck off video ever. I was gonna well not really fuck off, but I was going to add to Gigi's show. I had a metal tiger cage welded. A part cardboard floor. Your, your normal tiger cage for tigers. So then have one, so I have one made. Um, the plan was that Gigi comes, I have several of my rather large friends, and we get him in that fucking cage or we know the reason why. And I suppose we got we got to get Merle and, and Dino like taken care of too, but that's okay. I got plenty of friends. And the Spoets minions are large and they are not afraid of anything. And we're going to get him into that thing. If he's in clothes, then we cut his fucking clothes off out of the fucking thing naked in there. And we throw our shit on him. And we just pee on him and all this. And then we start handing him liquor. And then we put a girl in with him. And we had the girl. The girl was all ready. And we put shit on her. And then, you know, at some point, he stops screaming at us and realizes he's in a fucking cage. And then we, the night of the show, uh, 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 uh. And maybe we have to kidnap Merle and you know, I hadn't really thought this out, but whatever we had to do, we were going to do it. Oh, because I know we was the worst they'd do is kill us. They wouldn't call the cops. And then we we pull. It's on right on Broughton Street, which right now is is uh, Urban Outfitters, but at the time it was a 
Hyman and Sons, the price to look nice requires very little sacrifice. The black shopping district, it, the, the white people had run out of it, and they hadn't come back yet for the yuppie them since. Open that up, and here he is naked with a naked girl in the fucking street in Savannah. Then we get the band covered in shit. Covered in shit. We hand him a fucking microphone and ha kick Merle and then not play. And if they don't play, we're going to kick their ass and then we play. Of course, Pose has already played their set because we do our set first and then we put them up. And that was my idea. Never got to do it because between the time we booked the show and we're up there in New York about to play, and we're going to New York and we hear the news that Gigi's dead. And my buddy Chuck, who's in the, in the band, he was at the gas station show, and he was like, well, we saw him walking down a thing, and the, the Latinos were tossing bottles at him because they were naked and covered in shit, and all this is on Todd Phillips' uh, Hated. You know Todd Phillips, right? Mm -hmm. He did, did a lot of more popular films later. Mm -hmm. I tried to get Hated into the, into the theaters in Charlotte and in Hilton Head, mainly just so I could watch it on a theater. And those little bitches, they always want to know what the movie is. And it's a rock and roll documentary. Which one? Oh, you don't. You don't know him, uh, Gigi. It's from French, Gigi. Nah, nah, nah. They were just like, well, midnight show. No, no you know, porn theater. Well, there weren't any porn theaters anymore. But if we'd had a porn, if only we had an old-fashioned porn theater, just one. And uh, I didn't have the money to to rent equipment, you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. So, so I didn't. And Todd had a one print of the fucking movie. He was going to have to come down with it. And, uh, and I wouldn't want to meet Todd because he hadn't done what he'd done, but he'd done the best film I'd ever seen, G Hated in the Nation, G.G. Allen uh, thing, and I wanted to meet him. Never got to meet him, but we've corresponded. He's he, like, um, I think it was his, his production was Skinny White Guy Productions, and I, I would call, call him up and say, Hey, Todd, how does it, how does it nervous, skinny little white guy productions? <laughs> it's like, I'm sure there's some extra words in there, Mr. Corcoran. <laughs> He was a little nervous guy, though. He's kind of like a, I mean, I only met him on the phone, but it just seemed like kind of a fading goat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was impressed even more that he had made the Gigi, Gigi movie. So tell me about how Spoets kind of, the rise of Spoets. Spoets were immediately popular. We, our first show we had 300 people at because I was already known as a, as a performance poet. And, but I wouldn't do, well, I did some shows, but, you know, the poetry shows suck. Yeah. People that go to poetry shows so again, and uh, I had some friends drag some of their friends. I do mean drag to some of our shows. And once that happened, and they saw, wow, that is great. You know, I was just doing my stuff. And uh, there's a difference between performance poetry and music. I didn't know that. And there's a difference between music and noise. I still don't know that. And <laughs> and I just started doing one thing after another. I just think of the most retarded thing I could do, and I would do it. And then I would think to retop myself. And then I had a, a couple of codes. You never repeat yourself on a tour. You know, you're doing a tour, you do that tour, and you, you burn it. You know, like Louis C.K., except we do, do that once a month. And uh, I write new songs. We've got, got to become expert improv, improv, improvisers. I can't say that word now they got improv comedy. Ugh. Ugh. So wait, where were we? We were, we were about to order some whores. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Kevin Allison are going to three-hole this whore. <laughs> I know you don't like women, but you know, you'll know three-hole one with the king spoke, won't you? I'll give you a reach around, too, as long as you don't enjoy it. Wait, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> uh, All right, so, so we were, we were to the, the rise of Spoets. Spoets, yeah. Spoets was immediately popular. It, because somehow the formula that I'd come up with just spoke to the criminally insane, <laughs> alcoholic, <laughs> drug addict, sexually hyper. We would go to towns and, and first they would put a metal band or a punk band to open for us. And they would suck. Always they would suck. One of them was called the most retarded band name I've ever heard. If, if anybody's got a more retarded band name, I want to hear it. Brutal. Mastication. <laughs> no shit. Somebody decided that <laughs> was a good band name. <laughs> they're actually they're nice guys. Retarded, <laughs> but in a good way. I mean, like give you a hug, retarded, not like George Bush, you know. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> so what would you guys do in spoiled shows? Well, what would we do? Um, all right. Well, it started started slow. Um, we would. Uh, Burn a Bible, say uh, poetry about serial killers and rapists, and uh, we play uh, the backs of a dryer with a. The, I had a thing I call my Japanese drum, which is uh, you know how the dryer's got a, a, a full size dryer has like a hole in it where the thing goes out. If you pull that piece of metal off, it makes a great drum. Mm -hmm. Axe handle, and, and I would play that, and then we we bought some guitars. And, uh, and I decided that it would be a great idea to put an angle grinder on the front of my guitar. Thus, well, I actually, I got a, got a think Jim O'Rourke, famous noise artist, you, you're familiar? Mm -hmm. He did a show uh, called Chamber of the Elements, very famous show. I was there in Atlanta, same weekend as Freaknik. So we almost didn't get there for like the traffic and the, and the black folks. And we show up and he's doing this thing where he's doing like a little baby fan, he's got all these pedals, he's going, doo -doo 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 -doo. And it's great, and I was like, that's great, but it doesn't rock, because he's on a fucking table. So I built this guitar with the pedals, and the grinder for the no, mo no noise, and at first it was a, uh, uh, it wasn't a grinder, it was a, uh, some kind of appliance I'd taken apart, and I put a little grit wheel on it. Because that's all you need for the noise. And we'll go, tick, tick, tick. And we'll go, but that, of course, once I saw the little sparks coming out, I think, well, how big a grinder could I get on there? And, and what if safety issues were not a problem? <laughs> and what if I got this little nut that you can get and, uh, that will fuck your grinder up, even if it's a nice Makita? It gets you get the big things on a little grinder that you're not supposed to do. So I'd get a little grinder on the headstock of my guitar. It's like, ah! And I'm constantly pulling the nut off of the strap. So occasionally I have to wrap the strap around my neck and just like <laughs> while I'm playing. Um, and it, it will, most guitars will make you deaf if you listen to it, but this guitar will make you deaf and blind. <laughs> and it's one time.